our work is limitless. Every brushstroke, every blend, every scan, every decibel, every frame, every weave. Our actions might seem abstract, but we act with purpose. Our purpose is to solve problems using art, media, and design, to create community, and expand the world beyond the status quo. Through hard work and imagination, our aim is to leave the world better than how we found it. We create because we can. Because art is intuitive. We have a story to tell. We want to inspire. It's our dream. What will you create here? Welcome class of 2024, and thank you for tuning in to Emily Carr University's Connect event. My name is Joni Taylor, and I'm the coordinator of student recruitment. We recognize that we are living in an unprecedented time globally, so we are grateful that you are able to join us online from across North and South America, parts of Asia, Europe, Africa, and Australia. Welcome. Before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we live and work on the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. So this event will last approximately one hour. Uh, we have four presenters and one on a student panel highlighting the uniqueness of Emily Carr University, our community and programs. Our panel of four current students and alumni will be showcasing some of their work and talking about their experiences as students at Emily Carr, after which we're going to have a Q&A session. But in the meantime, if you have any questions, um, please, at any time during the, any of the presentations, please click on the tab at the bottom of your screen and um, we, we have our student services team standing by to answer your questions. Okay, to start off, it is my privilege to introduce our President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Jillian Sedol. Jill has had a long career in academic leadership and the performing arts. She holds an Honours BA, an MA, and a PhD in English, and is also a jazz vocalist and co-founder of the Guelph Jazz Festival. Please welcome Jill. Hi everyone. It is my great pleasure to have this opportunity to connect with you all today. I've had the privilege of being president of Emily Carr University for almost two years now. And there's so much I would love to tell you about this extraordinary place and its extraordinary people. It can actually be difficult to know where to start. But more than anything, I want you to know that I'm incredibly proud of this university and its remarkable and resilient creative community a community that you will soon become a part of. We have brilliant faculty who will work closely with you in our beautiful new state-of-the-art campus. Our incredible staff will work hard to make your experience at Emily Carr unforgettable. And our students and alumni are truly exceptional, proving themselves time and again to be leaders among their peers and committed to driving change toward a better future through creative thought and hard work. This incredible community of students, staff, and faculty is the reason why Emily Carr is recognized by the QS World University rankings as the best place in Canada to study art and design and among the top 40 universities worldwide. I know this is a strange time to be starting your university degree. COVID-19 has touched virtually every aspect of our lives and university life is no exception. You're probably wondering what your experience at Emily Carr will be like over the next year. I can assure you that we've been hard at work planning for a variety of different scenarios to ensure that we're ready for you in September. There's still much uncertainty about how this pandemic will unfold, but one thing I am sure of, no matter what happens, you will get an outstanding world-class education as a student at Emily Carr University. It's becoming clear that in many ways, our world will never be the same after COVID-19. There will be challenges, but there is also tremendous opportunity, opportunity to shape and remake our world in ways that might have seemed impossible before. We might finally be able to make changes necessary to slow down climate change. We might discover innovative ways to reduce poverty. We may design new solutions to improve global health. 
Now, more than ever, society needs people who can imagine new possibilities in the face of an uncertain future. A post-pandemic world will need active, engaged participants in ways we're only beginning to understand. Such a world will need creative thinkers and innovators, people who feel empowered to help build inclusive communities where social and environmental justice can flourish. People like Material Matters co-director Keith Doyle, Emily Carr Associate Dean Allende Fraser, William Newhouse, Emily Carr's Director of Tec Technical Services and Studio Technician Logan Moore, who are behind the initiative to repurpose Emily Carr's arsenal of 3D printers and producing face shields for health workers on the front lines in the fight against COVID-19. I can think of no better place to build your readiness for the coming years and to become part of that community of change makers and leaders than right here at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being here today. I'm just delighted to meet you all, and I look forward to seeing you very soon as you begin your journey at Emily Carr. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Uh, next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Trish Kelly, our Vice President, academic and provost who joined Emily Carr as an associate professor in 2011. Trish has served as assistant dean and has taught first year undergraduate courses through to graduate studies for which she received uh, the Ian Wallace Teaching Award which recognizes excellence and innovation in teaching. Trish? Thanks Joni. So excited to be here tonight and meet you all however virtually. You should be proud of your achievements. The admissions process here at Emily Carr is highly competitive, so well done. This event is intended to help you understand the choices you have in front of you and address questions you might have about the curriculum, culture, and creative opportunities you will have at ECU. With our internationally recognized faculty and extensive facilities geared towards making, here I mean digital fabrication labs, wood and metal shops, animation and post-production studios, flexible materials and prototyping labs, ceramics, photography, and print media studios. The list could really go on. We're confident and excited about the work we're doing here as a globally recognized art, media, and design institution. And we're excited about who we are and welcome you to be part of it. I'm the Provost and Chief Academic Officer at the University, responsible for the academic integrity of the institution and its accountability to the government as a public art and design institution. I work with faculty to ensure the university's curriculum, technical services, lab supports, and research facilities are cutting edge, and that we collectively create a fulsome and challenging student experience that emphasizes criticality, self-reflexivity, hands-on material exploration, and cultural and contextual understanding and awareness. Throughout, emphasis is placed on professional development and career training to ensure students can meet their post-graduation goals. I feel privileged to work with amazing faculty and technical staff who are here to push and support you as you move forward in your creative practice. I'm sure you have many questions regarding what will happen in the fall, specifically in terms of the reality of realities of COVID-19. The entire post-secondary landscape, along with every other sphere of public life, has been affected by this pandemic. As a public institution, we are working closely with the Ministry of Advanced Education and Provincial Health Authorities to determine exactly what our fall semester will look like. We do anticipate some alternative instructional models, some online courses, increased remote access to studios and labs, hybrid curriculum, while also preparing for the reintroduction of more traditional curriculum with social distancing also factored in. The safety of our students and their continuity of learning during the pandemic are our top priorities. Thanks for taking the time to be here with us tonight and welcome to the Emily Carr community. Thank you, Trish. Appreciate that. Um, I want to take a moment here to conduct a quick poll. So we're going to ask you this question, which region are you participating from? And you will see the poll appearing on your screen. Um, so please feel free to respond and then uh, hit submit. Oh, lots of answers are coming in. 
and then I'm going to share the results with you all, you might, which you might find interesting. Looks like we're getting lots of questions in the Q&A area too, so keep those questions coming. Okay, good. It looks like uh, most people have responded, so I'm going to share the results here. So you should all see the results there. It looks like we have 74% um, of the respondents are responding from North America. Ooh, we have one from South America and 2% uh, from Europe, um, a large contingent from Asia. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Next up is Kevin Bird. Uh, Kevin is the interim uh, executive director and registrar for student services. Kevin has been part of the student services team for 20 years. So welcome, Kevin. Hello, everybody, and welcome class of 2024. On behalf of student services and the university community, I really want to extend a, a wholehearted uh, welcome to all of you. While your journey here will be one of many twists and turns, turns as we navigate the new reality of COVID-19 together, student services will be here to assist your transition in whatever form that might take. Your student services team includes the admissions department, which many of you have become familiar with as they've guided you through the admissions process. They will, they will be here to assist you with any of your admission questions, any transfer credit, concerns you might have and any housing questions that you might have. We also have a graduate studies advising uh, office and they will be happy to assist you with questions related to your graduate program and graduate planning. We also have an academic advising team and they can assist you with your course registration questions. We're getting ready to register our students for this fall and most of you will be looking at registering sometime in June. So watch out for those emails from our academic advising office. We also have an accessibility services area and those folks can assist you with any learning accommodation or questions you might have. We have a counseling and wellness service who will provide a range of, of services and activities that will support your well-being throughout your time with us. We also have a financial aid and awards office and they will assist you with questions related to student loans and scholarship opportunities. And we have an international programs unit and they will help you with student mobility questions, exchange questions and assist you with any questions related to your study or work permits and visas as well as study abroad opportunities. And we have a career and work, work integrated learning department, and they will provide a wide range of services and activities to help you prepare for a successful professional career within the creative industries once you're here. I encourage all of you to connect with our student services team. We are here to support you as you transition to us and continue on your new and exciting post-secondary journey. All the best and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And just to reiterate what Kevin said about the uh, university's response to COVID-19, you can click on the um, tab on our website for uh, new students for the latest information. Our next presenter is Sissy Fu. Dr. Sissy Fu is the Dean of the Faculty of Culture and Community Sissy joined Emily Carr three and a half years ago and is responsible for foundation curriculum and activities. Sissy holds degrees in politics and philosophy from Harvard University and the University of Oxford. Welcome, Sissy. Thank you, Joni. Good evening, everyone, and good night um, to one of us who is uh, in, I believe, Mexico. And um, also a very, very early good morning uh, to those of us joining from Europe and also good morning to everybody uh, from Asia. I am Sissy, um, as Joni mentioned. And as I call up my slides, um, hopefully this is also a way um, to answer some of the questions that are popping up. 
in the question and answer. So um, what I'm going to do is to give everybody a bit of an overview, a bit of a teaser, if you will, of the curriculum that, that you could look forward to in your first year at Emily Carr. And from then on, also speak a little bit about the transition from the first year into your major of choice, so that you have a sense of um, the kind of creative, critical thinking, making, and doing um, you will be engaging in in your four years of Emily Carr. What you see here in front of you um, looks like something that is a bit punishing. Uh, the type of thing that you might see in front of a blackboard, perhaps, or perhaps an empty wall, as was the case in the 1970s when conceptual artist John Baldessari actually sent a prompt remotely across the continent, just very simply seeking volunteers and participants to continue to write this phrase on a wall in an art school. It says, I will not make any more boring art. And as we follow the prompt, we find that in fact, um, every iteration varies a little bit, uh, that while there are rules about the things that we write and the types of wisdoms that if we accumulate as we go through primary school, secondary school, university, that there will always be a sort of distinctiveness that make what you do yours. This is an exercise, uh, a conceptual exercise, if you will, um, in authorship and creativity. How does that relate to the work that you will be doing at Emily Carr? Well, let's think about the ways in which various things look differently once we're able to change various elements of what we can see, what we can feel, and how we make together individually, collaboratively, alongside each other. What Emily Carr offers in its first year is really the building blocks for your creative career. The way in which you have conversations, the way that concepts and ideas, those past, those that are current, and also those in the future, actually connect with how our actual environment is that it changes with the ecology, with the environment, with the climate, including the atmosphere in studios, in classrooms, in big lectures, in small seminars, and also, oh, of course, in all the corridors and the hallways in which formal and informal ways of connecting takes place. And that's why Foundation is housed in the Faculty of Culture and Community that I'm so very excited to introduce to you. As Dean of the Faculty of Culture and Community, there are various things that, that really become core to any educational endeavor in the 21st century. It is not just about acquiring the technical skills and the creative knowledge um, that will help you shape your practice and your career into the future. It is also the way in which we form cultures all together, that we make publics within the institution itself, be it Emily Carr, be it a country, be it a city, or be it a world. This is not a typo. It does say co-mutiny. We tend to think of what mutates as those things that change, but those of us who um, are Latin nerds might find that mutiny actually comes from the root for movement. What we do at Emily Carr, especially in the first year, is a grounding of how we move together and that there is no single culture. We are not trying to make you into a mold. Like Baldessari and his exercise, we are trying to get you to see the boundaries and the rules and the parameters of what makes for a particular kind of practice and an interconnection of practices so that you can found your own culture, if you will. A little bit about the foundation year curriculum then. What you will find is that as you register for courses, and this takes place on Friday the 26th of June, that there are various choices that you could make. In fact, the foundation year is composed with a lot of variation within each requirement. What you see in front of you are the six core foundational units of your first year. The academic core, 
um, in the first semester and the second semester in the fall and the spring gives you the critical vocabulary and the principles and the concepts that is help that is going to help you shape the way that you understand what you do in your core studios. It is a very deliberate and unique thing that Emily Carr does to introduce interdisciplinarity right off the bat. And that is the interdisciplinary core studio where there are activities from drawing to collaborative endeavors to principles of applications of color and light and material investigations, all towards emphasizing the relationship between creative and critical practices. You can expect to move from 2D to 3D to 4D practices, those things that are time-based, those things that are static, the things that you can put on walls, the things that, that pertain in the space between you and the screen, you and your faculty member, you and the group. In the first semester, you will also find a very special course called Creative Processes. That is actually a course about resilience, about iteration, about the imagination, and actually quite crucially, about how to fail, to fail again, and to fail better. As an artist, as a designer, as a media artist, this is what Emily Carr is going to give you, a sense of how you are going to move forward as you try out different things, explore with excitement, all those affordances in the world, be it technological, be it conversational, be it discursive. In the second semester, there is a visual arts, media, and design differentiated core studio. So you could focus a little bit more on the type of practice that would lead to the Bachelor of Fine Art, the Bachelor of Media Art, and the Bachelor of Design. And finally, in the second semester, there is the elective studio where there is a chance for foundation students to be in studios uh, where major practices occur then through practice itself and a hands-on understanding we hope that students have a better sense of the type of major that one would like to engage in alongside the curricular parts is the foundation forum a gathering every week during the semester where we invite alumna and uh, alumni to return and speak to foundation students about their careers. So um, as Trish mentioned, professional practices start right at the beginning of the Emily Carr education. There are also speakers who would offer workshops um, to give everybody a sense of what is uh, accompanying the curriculum that you take. Quite crucially, towards the end of uh, your first year experience at Emily Carr, there is a foundation show. The first time that you would be participating in a group show that takes up all the spaces within Emily Carr itself. Um, and this is always an occasion for celebration with parents who support you, with faculty who support you, with all the staff of Emily Carr actually rallying your journey in, from first year into your second year. And finally, in foundation, there is the foundation program office that makes sure that what you learn in classrooms and studios and shops is complemented by the ways in which they could be applied um, to the wider world, as well as how it connects to um, display and celebration opportunities such as the foundation show. Foundation also has its own shop uh, with uh, cutting edge equipment um, that allows for the type of material and technical investigations that also help make decisions about majors to come. A little bit about the degree programs uh, that Foundation actually builds for. There are three degrees at Emily Carr, the BFA, the BDES, and the BMA. And what you see on screen are the different major trajectories uh, that any Emily Carr student from Foundation could choose to enter into. Um, some of them are more interdisciplinary than others, um, and some are very focused um, in a particular kind of technique that accompanies that particular career outcome. So um, we see differences uh, in the ways in which, say, our Bachelor of Media Arts degrees are uh, 
raised such that there are confluences and connections between the media arts. So from animation and storytelling, there are various different forms of output. In the Bachelor of Design, um, there is communication design, industrial design, interaction design. Um, there may be questions that you have that I'd be very happy to answer later. And our student panel could definitely shed light on how these different degrees and major outcomes differ. And in the BFA, there is the interdisciplinary visual arts degree, which allows for um, students to engage in painting and ceramics at once. Um, there is the more concentrated photography degree and illustration degrees, and also a unique degree um, in critical and cultural practices that actually centers making from um, a theory, theoretical and contextual and cultural standpoint. So it really um, covers quite a range of different ways of how we start thinking about making. There are also three minors at Emily Carr, Art and Text, Curatorial Practice, and Social Practice and Community Engagement. These are courses that could fit across whichever major you decide to take. So think of the minor as a supplementary interdisciplinary moment where you get to meet students from outside your degree and have these collaborative conversations in order to further shape and supplement your primary practice. With all of this, I come back to cultures and community, of community, how we move together, especially in this particular time where perhaps various senses of spaces and temporalities feel suspended. At these moments, it is about how we come together and move together to create a world nearly a way in which we can reset the parameters of how we live and therefore also make together and also um, the way in which the world can be formed. I greatly look forward to welcoming you to the Faculty of Culture and Community and to your foundation year. Thank you, Sissy. So now we're gonna move on to our student and alumni panel. Uh, so we have four uh, guests with us here tonight on this panel. We have Stephanie uh, Broder, uh, Michelle Chan, Jonathan Alfaro, and Sarah Crivelli. We're going to start with um, Stephanie. So what we're going to do here is we're going to um, um, uh, each, each uh, guest on the panel will have an opportunity to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their work, and then after that I will field questions uh, from our studio audience. So we'll start with Stephanie. She is a Bachelor of Fine Arts Illustration major graduate from 2019. Um, Stephanie, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be speaking again at this event. Unfortunately, this one is online but you know in my first year I had to watch the online one anyways because I wasn't in Vancouver so it's all good it's all good information so yeah as Joni mentioned I majored in illustration and I graduated last May um, since then I got a job at a local book bindery um, the combination of writing or text and art was always interesting to me as a student and continues to be interesting to me in my career um, on top of doing lots of illustration work, I also spent a lot of time in the printmaking department. So yes, there is opportunities to work in areas outside your major. Um, in particular, I did letterpress and silk screen work, which again was very much focused on that combination of art and text. And all of that to say that it led me to my grad project, which you can see on the screen here. I wrote part of a novel in a semester. I wrote maybe a quarter of a first draft of a novel and created some accompanying illustrations for it, as well as chapter title pages that were illustrated, and then brought it all together for the book you see here. Um, and then at the grad show, it was displayed with a couple of these finished pieces on a shelf for folks to handle and read. And I also created a vinyl art illustration to go display around it on the wall to um, draw people in and highlight some of the illustration aspects of it. Your book is beautiful. It looks beautiful. Can you tell us a little bit about the production process? 
Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I actually did pretty much all the steps of bringing it to reality. So not only did I do the writing and illustrations, but I did the design for the for the actual cover itself, as well as the page layout design on the interior. So I was working with InDesign, um, Illustrator, as well as paper and pencil. I literally every step of the process. Um, but the one thing that I couldn't do myself was print and bind it to the professional level that I wanted. So I actually used our on-campus printing lab, which is called the Doc, And it was there that they helped me print it and create this perfect bound book, um, which I have one anyone can see my camera it's a beautiful physical object that I now get to keep so yeah I couldn't have created it as a physical object without the help of the doc oh that's great yeah the doc is the digital output center and it's a wonderful support for all students from all majors thanks Stephanie uh, next we have Michelle Chan who is a Bachelor of Design interaction design major and uh, she is now in her fourth year. Michelle? Hi, thanks Joni. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Michelle and I started my journey at Emily Carr in 2016 back at the Granville Island campus. Um, coming straight out of high school, I knew I wanted to do some sort of design, but I wasn't sure which one I wanted to do specifically. So in first year, I spent a lot of my time exploring all the different types of art and design practices, such as printmaking, photography, and industrial design. Uh, once we had our majors picked out and approved in second year, we really started to focus on developing our skills as interaction designers. Um, I learned to program HTML, uh, C++, and some Arduino stuff. Uh, we also worked on our research skills um, UI, U, UX UI process, as well as some graphic design like typography and motion graphics. I would say it was about halfway through third year, that's when I realized that I felt very passionate about health design, as I saw that a lot of my work usually re revolves around health and wellness. Um, I'm especially interested in UX UI, um, service design and design research, uh, which are all incorporated in my grad project Hilo, as you can see, in the screen. Um, so Hilo is a diabetes management tool for young patients and their families. This is a digital diabetes management tool that aims to demystify childhood diabetes by empowering the child with agency and responsibilities while also getting the caretakers to provide the appropriate care and support. For this eight month project, I carried out the research and design of the product's function and service. I was also able to work and co-create with patients and caretakers who have experience with childhood diabetes, which was a really amazing experience. Um, many of us were also in a class called Design for Startups, which helped us develop the business side of our grad projects. Uh, and we had the opportunity to pitch our project, uh, product to a panel of experienced and successful entrepreneurs, including an individual who got a deal in Shark Tank. So that was a really awesome experience. So through my years at Emily Carr, I was also able to land a couple of professional opportunities and being able to work in healthcare as a designer before finishing my bachelor's really gave me the confidence and foundation to enter the workforce. Wow. Yeah, that, that's my time. <laughs> my time at Emily Carr. <laughs> that's great. Well, that's wonderful. It sounds like you've had a very uh, diverse experience within interaction design. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it, interaction design is a very broad range of stuff. Um, so for me, it's most it's mostly about UX, UI, design research, and service design. But for some of my other colleagues, it's you know interactive installations, programming and tech, using stuff like Arduino's and Raspberry Pis. Um, some people also do AR and VR. Um, we also do critical design, experimental design, sound design is also really cool. There's a lot of people who look into that too. Um, game design, um, a lot of people find themselves between interaction industrial or interaction and communication. And it's really like your call. Um, the cool part about interaction design is that you can really make it your own. Like you can take your external interests and mix it with your interaction design practice and come up with something new and incredible. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really versatile, versatile major and it allows for a lot of exploration. 
Yeah, well, that sounds great. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, the next um, up is Jonathan Alfaro. Jonathan is a Bachelor of Fine Arts Visual Arts major, uh, and he is in his fourth year as well. Jonathan? Uh, hello. <laughs> hi. Uh, so hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited that you're going to be joining the Emily Carr community. Um, so I was able to transfer to Emily Carr at the beginning of second year, and I came to Emily Carr specifically for the clinical and cultural practice major, which was a really, really great program. As with all majors, you are required to take some classes that exist outside of your specific umbrella. And in the, one of those classes was a second semester class of that second year class. Uh, it was a painting class with Rebecca Brewer, one of the faculty members there. And she was not only able to really challenge our own paintings, like each individual painting, but also really challenged us to rethink our art practices in total. Um, Rebecca really highlighted the ways that other materials, not just paint on canvas, could be used to record history and time around us. And um, this really launched my own exploration to textiles, which I have still yet to leave, and also was the foundation as to why I actually transferred out of that critical and cultural program um, into a specifically visual arts um, major instead. Um, and yeah, so this process came everywhere from uh, learning to like deconstruct linen to weaving it back together um, and to the point now where I'm actually working on like a 45 inch like Clara loom at my studio um, using like 100% Canadian sourced uh, woolen yarn. Oh. Uh, the artwork that you see here is a close up of a photo. Uh, sorry, it's a close up um, of an artwork I did for a show that was curated by Emily Hermont, who's a sculpture. Um, faculty member. Um, the show is titled Intertwined and really looked to highlight textile-based practices in Emily Carr community. There was a call for artists that was put out in, in that year's April and once I received that acceptance letter to the exhibition, I got started working. Um, the artwork ended up taking me around 147 hours. Um, the artwork in total is about a meter and a half by three meters and it's kind of like draped over a dowel. Um, itself, it's called Every Contact Leaves Traces. Um, as I was kind of thinking through um, ways in which the fiber itself could hold onto its memory of its own creation. Oh, well, I mean, it sounds interesting and it looks really beautiful. For those of you who aren't aware, the image that you're seeing on the screen uh, behind Jonathan's name is actually the piece that he's referring to. Can you tell us a little bit about the process? Yeah, so I had this idea for this artwork I really wanted to make. Um, I had been testing this idea on this tiny little, I still have this little guy. I'll see if my um, YouTube skills for showing things off is working here. Um, but <laughs> it was this tiny little piece of linen that I had tried this on where I was meticulously going through and sniffing individual fibers and pulling them out with my boyfriend's tweezers, who I managed, which I managed to destroy in the process. Um, but I had spent really little time working in textiles, so I was able to contact Jen and Claire, who are the technicians in the soft shop at Emily Carr, who are so amazing if you're ever looking to explore textiles. And they really helped me troubleshoot how I could take this tiny little sample and enlarge it to that really large artwork that I ended up making. Um, and in, in that way, I took this big piece of linen I had bought to stretch over canvases and I snipped each individual fiber and with tweezers pulled every thread out. I ended up removing about 90% of the material that it was made of. At the end, I have what you see there, which is this like essentially piece of gauze that can barely hold itself together, but it was really fun. That's, it's very beautiful. Thank you for sharing it with us. Okay, and next up now we have Sarah. Sarah Crivelli is a Bachelor of Media Arts 2D animation major. Uh, she's also in her fourth year. Um, Sarah. Hi. Hey. Uh, yeah, I'm Sarah and uh, I'm actually an international student. So my first time coming to Emily Carr was actually my first time coming to Canada, which it was such an amazing experience. Um, yeah, I'm in 2D experimental animation and it's such a wide program and it has all these different 
interdisciplinary practices when it comes to exploring animation as a uh, genre of practice. Um, the thing that I'm most interested in is kind of working with the pre-production animation. So anything having to do with concept art and character design and all of that jazz is like my jam. So being able to come to Emily Carr and like learn about animation and the ins and outs of it is honestly so cool. <laughs> just, yeah, and uh, I even got a chance this year to make my very own um, short film. It's not completed yet, but it's getting there. And it's, I'm really excited to see the finished product and having all of my professors being able to back me up on it and support me and help me out and give me good critiques and everything is just wonderful. So uh, this piece that we're seeing on the screen now is part of a conceptual piece, a larger conceptual, conceptual piece. Can you tell us what concept art is and what interests you about that? Yeah, so concept art is kind of like a, it's more of like an umbrella for a lot of the pre-production work that goes into any film, game, TV show, just anything really. Uh, it's essentially the, the time that you're spending coming up with the concepts for the media. So coming up with the characters, coming up with the environments, the props, um, like what kind of world is it? Is it a sci-fi world? Is it a fantasy world? How are you going to depict this in whatever medium you're using? Um, so concept art for uh, a 2D department is maybe a lot different from concept art for a 3D department because you're working with different materials uh, or if you're working with stop motion, like you have to think about the materials you're using and kind of how to translate that into the final product. So the concept art is kind of just, you know, coming up with the concepts for everything. Yeah, well, it sounds really interesting. This piece is really beautiful. The color scheme is quite nice. It goes with our yeah. colors, the slideshow too. So well done. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Thanks all. We're going to actually take your questions now from the audience. Um, the first one here is for Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie, I know that you were pretty involved with campus life while you were a student. Can you tell us about your experiences uh, with campus life? Yeah, for sure. So Emily Carr is a pretty small university. We have a fairly small student body. Um, and so some people are worried that that will somehow reduce their opportunities to get involved or become engaged with other students. But I found it to be quite the opposite because it is a small student body. It's really easy to get to know people and to find new opportunities. So I pretty much participated in something new every year. So I was a student ambassador for a while, which was actually working for the university to help incoming students um, learn about the school and get settled in. And then the year after that, I ran for the students union, which was a volunteer position to support and represent students um, on, on behalf of the student body to the university to make sure that our needs are being met as students. Um, and then in my fourth year, I participated in the curatorial committee for the grad show. So usually a graduating class has a big to do at the end and we all display our work and it's actually the graduating students themselves with the support of faculty and staff who curate that entire show. So I was able to, with the help of another illustration student, um, curate the entire illustration section of the show. So yeah, there's a lot of opportunities to get involved as long as you're willing to look around. We also have very active club scenes and lots of events that are going on all the time. So yeah, I just encourage you to keep your eyes open and don't be shy to get to know, know people. Yeah, that's true. Thanks, Stephanie. All right, the next question up is for Michelle. So um, uh, we're all aware that Emily Carr off offers a robust career development and work integrated learning program. Um, and I know that you've been involved with that. Can you tell us about your experience with this program? Um, yeah, so last summer I was able to work with the learning technologies team at Vancouver Coastal Health as a media multimedia designer for five months. I was lucky enough to be the lead designer of the My Guide Concussion website that we designed for one of the VCH facilities, um, the GF Strong Rehabilitation Center. Um, so along with an instructional designer and a developer, as well as some clinicians and patients from GF Strong, we were able to build this resource site from scratch, which includes the site itself, 
as well as 96 illustrations and diagrams that went along with each article. Um, yeah, it was a really ex amazing experience uh, working in the government. Um, it was really insightful. Um, the pressure was definitely there, but it made me a more rigorous designer, for sure. Um, I also work at the Health Design Lab here at Emily Carr. Uh, right now, we're working on a research piece about pharmacogenetics. We're working with the Canadian Digital Supercluster, uh, TELUS Health, Genome BC, and Life Labs to understand the physician's perspective of the implementation of pharmacogenetics in clinical practice. Um, we're working with the TELUS UX team on this project, and it's really awesome uh, that we get a glimpse of what their process looks like. So the Career Development Office really helped us out with all our co-op needs. Um, they get us really awesome opportunities and facilitate the conversations and evaluations between us and the employers. Um, they also take their time to talk us through our challenges and struggles, uh, especially like professionally. And they also host amazing events like the Careers Week Portfolio Review at Microsoft last year. Um, during that event, we were you know, meeting with Samsung, Google, Microsoft, EA, and a bunch of other awesome companies and receiving feedback um, from all these different companies from different types of designers was really amazing. It was like one of the best experiences ever. Um, yeah, they're all really great at the office. They know you personally and they take care of you. And I'm really grateful that they were able to help and nudge me forward in my career. Wow. That sounds amazing. It sounds like you were very busy um, within that program. So that's, I, I hope that's been helpful for you. Oh yeah, it was totally. Excellent. That's great. Good. So we have another question here now for, this one's for Jonathan. I'm aware that you recently gave a skill up presentation through, um, I think it was career and professional development as well. Um, but can you, um, I think your presentation was on reaching out to community. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about what led to this speaking opportunity and then how it impacted you as a student? Yeah, so in, uh, I guess you can take the class in third or fourth year. I decided to take it in fourth year. It's, it's a professional practice class. Um, and this one specifically was being taught by Annie Briard. Um, and in the class, one of our final assignments is really focused on putting together our own exploration into a way that we are going to be pushing ourselves professionally into the future. So I had chosen to do research on what it looked like to find alternative spaces for hosting our own, like our exhibitions. And while I was doing this research and I was able to contact people who are willing to give me spaces, I actually came to the realization that the reason why I was able to find those spaces was not because of a formula, but because of the communities that we're able to uh, create and connect with. So I then shifted my research into how can we actually contact and create communities with people. So I ended up giving my final presentation on this topic and Annie Briard was really excited by my research and actually asked me to do one of these skill up presentations through the Shumka Center. So these little talks happen over a lunch period. They're only about like 30 minutes long. Um, and it's really nice. They go right throughout the semesters and each week there's different speakers everything from um, talks that are held by like myself, like a student, but then also industry professionals that will be talking to you everything from how to like package and create artwork to how to uh, build a website, how to look at your CV, um, artist statements, all of like so many different topics that end up being like really, really, really helpful. Um, and in my case, I was able to give this talk and it was really nice having a lot of peers who showed up and giving me like positive feedback after. Um, and then even for myself, just re-looking at how I viewed creating community and how actively in this own talk, I was able to see like how that community was being created actively. Wow, that's great. That's, that sounds like a great opportunity too. I had forgotten to mention that about the uh, professional development and the professional practices classes. Those are, are very valuable. I'm glad you uh, received that great opportunity through that. Good. Thanks. Okay, and there's another question uh, here for this one. I'll give to Sarah. Uh, it's about animation. So can you tell me uh, the difference between 2D and 3D animation? Because I know you were in 2D animation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so 2D animation, the best way to think about it is it's just two dimensional. So 
any of the old Disney films like Aristocats, Lion King, anything like that, that is 2D animation. So traditional animation. Um, 3D animation is three-dimensional. So it is things that are like, like Moana, uh, Frozen, a lot of video games nowadays are all 3D uh, animated. And, and essentially just, it's kind of a difference of just how you make it. So 3D has a lot to do with modeling and rigging. Uh, rigging is basically kind of putting the skeleton into the clay model. This is the simplest way to describe it. Um, so you have to kind of mold the character in the program. And then from there, you can start adding the textures, putting the, like, rigging it, um, doing the UV maps and all that jazz. And then eventually you'll be able to do the animation, which leads on to a lot of the movies you know nowadays that are 3D. Uh, 2D animation is all flat. Um, there are different ways to do 2D animation. Uh, you can do it just the traditional way where you're just drawing every single frame. You can do puppet animation, which is very common in a lot of TV shows. Uh, shows like My Little Pony, uh, Family Guy, things like that, those are all puppet animation. So it's similar to how you build 3D animation, but it's just two-dimensional. So you have all these different parts for the characters that you kind of tie together. Uh, yeah. Oh, excellent. That's, that's very helpful. Now, I know that there's um, a variety of studio spaces. So um, the, I guess there's the digital, there's the, um, and then there's the quieter st studios for the, um, to, um, for creating uh, the um, uh, stop motion animation. And did you work in both um, areas or were you primarily digital? Uh, yeah, so we have the animation lab, which is, maybe I'm biased, but it's one of my favorite spaces in the school. It's just extremely large. The most, if not all, the computers have uh, Cintiqs, so it's great for, like, the 2D animators who want to, like, see when they're drawing digitally. Um, a lot of the computers have, like, all the programs we need if you're in 3D or if you're in 2D. So the animation lab is just wonderful. Uh, they also have light tables, so if you want to go like super traditional, you can like actually get paper and pencil out and start animating on one of the light tables. And we even have like an old fancy uh, peg hole puncher that's like one of like five in Canada, so that's super cool. And as far as the, the stop motion room goes, um, we have a also a very large uh, camera room that is equipped with a multitude of very old, very expensive cameras. And you can use those to film either stop motion, you can do um, traditional paper, uh, traditional puppet animation. So with like just cut out paper, uh, you can do all kinds of things. And I was very fortunate um, in my summer of 2019, I took a stop motion class and I actually got to make a stop motion puppet which I don't know if you can see him. He's kind of just chilling out right over there. Maybe I'll grab him. But uh, I got to build an actual stop motion puppet and then animate it in the camera room. And it was, it was really cool and also very hard. <laughs> okay, we've got another question. Uh, this one's about housing. So I'm going to uh, see who, which, which one of you would like to respond to this. I know, Sarah, you've had a fairly positive experience with housing. Um, is there anyone else who would like to respond to that? Or Sarah, would you like to speak to that? About housing options? Yeah. Uh, sorry, go, go ahead. If nobody else wants to. <laughs> if nobody else wants to, then yeah, definitely. Um, since I'm international, finding housing here was a bit of a challenge. Um, because I don't have any family here. I couldn't just stay with family and I didn't know anybody either. So kind of doing like a, just rooming with some random people was just kind of a hard decision. So what we decided to do was enroll me into the uh, homestay program. And for those of you who don't know, a homestay program is where you go and live with another family. And it's great if you're coming from a different country or if you're coming from the other side of Canada where you're not used to the culture here. So like, it's wonderful to just kind of have them help you meld into the culture and like help you around. And 
I really lucked out. I absolutely adore my host family. I've been here in the same house for four years now. Um, and it's absolutely wonderful. And it's uh, really easy to just kind of apply and get matched with like the best family. Um, and I was also lucky enough that two of my roommates, one of them has moved out uh, recently, but two of them actually were also students in Emily Carr. Uh, one of them in the same year as me. So it's like bonus points. I also have two Emily Carr students living in my house with me. So, woo! <laughs> but yeah, definitely, definitely going for homestay. <laughs> And now um, we do have a robust um, uh, housing office that operates uh, typically during the summer. So if this is something that any of you out there are interested in, in finding resources, uh, you can always email housing at ecuad.ca and they can assist you with um, the possibility of housing resources. Okay, so we're coming to a close now. And um, so I would just like to thank all of our participants who have um, joined us here today. But before I close, I want to let you know about um, accepting your offer. Uh, you've received this information um, through an email from admissions. Uh, but we've we've set up the link here for you on this uh, page here So you can just go to that link and it gives you all the information about how to accept your offer uh, In order to do so you would need to pay your deposit by the deadline of May 1st Okay um, So you could also email admissions at ecuad uh, .ca if you have any questions about how to um, pay your deposit. Okay, the other thing I'd like to uh, do is we are going to send you a survey because we want to find out how, if this was helpful for you, we want to find out how we did. So please take a moment to take the survey. We will be sending it to your email. Um, and so then you'll do just be a link in there. You can click on that. We're also going to include the uh, websites of our four student panelists. So you can look at their work further and um, maybe contact them through their websites. They've got some really cool work up there. So that'll help you kind of get to know them a little bit better. Okay, uh, so thank you all very much for attending uh, today to our future students, our current students and our former students who joined us today. I'd like to thank all of the presenters who spoke and all of my Emily Carr colleagues who worked behind the scenes tirelessly answering your questions. Uh, thank you all for attending. It's been our pleasure to connect with you online. Uh, so please do email us if you have any further questions. Otherwise, see you in the fall and stay safe. Thank you all.